All right, guys. Continuing in the spirit of gratitude, I would like to thank you all for being here today. Without your participation, we'd all just be talking to each other and nobody would really learn anything. Each of these ladies has a role for you to learn today. We've got six stories to share about our leadership, our backgrounds, and our own experiences. Our roles are not exclusive. They can be applied to women and men in any workplace situation, and we hope that you take away a rule today that helps you to be a better leader. Now, with that being said, I'll kick it off with rule number one. A mentor once told me that to get something done, you should give it to the busiest person that you know. The idea is that busy people prioritize tasks and set deadlines because they have to get things done, whereas a less busy person doesn't have the same pressures that come with a full calendar, a full planner, and a full to-do list. Now, I've always been the busiest person that I know. Ask my friends. I live and die by a calendar invite. I'm a self-proclaimed workaholic, and I hate free time. It drives me crazy. This past semester, I had the chance to study an intern in Washington, D.C. through the Fund for American Studies and the Reagan Foundation. Our program was centered on the idea of leadership in the American presidency, and I gained incredible insight about the leaders of our own country as well as my own leadership. My internship was with a communications firm in the city, and in an attempt to combat my own anxieties about walking into an entirely new workplace, I resolved that even if I hated my internship, I would be the best intern that they had ever had. As the semester unfolded, I picked up work for over, from over 10 different client accounts, working on a diverse range of projects, from writing social media copy, to research projects, to sending packages to social media influencers, and even making name tags. And y'all, I made so many name tags. <laughs> I said yes to almost every project or task that came my way, no matter how big, how small, or how close the deadline for it was. That same mentor that I spoke about earlier also told me this. He said, say yes, within reason. Say yes to projects that you can prioritize and accomplish without sacrificing the quality of your work. People will turn to you because you can get things done and you can do them well, but there's a line that we all have to be mindful of. When you become so busy that the quality of your work starts to suffer as a result, it doesn't matter how many projects, papers, proposals, or presentations that you get through. When your work stops being as good as you are, then you lose more than time. You lose credibility, you lose respect. Thankfully, that mentor gave me that sage advice early on, and I was mindful to say yes within reason for the rest of the semester. That hard work paid off. I loved my internship site, and I still consult with them on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean there weren't times in which my to-do list gave me major anxiety. Biting off more than you can chew is something that we will all experience, and having to step back and delegate is what makes us human. Having the integrity to realize when you need to do so is what makes us leaders. In the LTAP program, we talked a lot about what it means to be a leader, what it looks like, what it takes, and what we thought the most important leadership qualities were. To me, the most important leadership quality that anybody can have is the desire to work. Think about all the leaders that you look up to. Are they in those positions because they spend a majority of their time relaxing on the couch, watching the Food Network? Probably not. Or are they in those goals and positions because they have a desire to work to accomplish their goals? Now, the moral of my story isn't to be more like me, and it's not to take on so much that you can't breathe. It's to start saying yes within reason. Remain cognizant of your limits, your time, and your abilities. Become the person that your boss thinks of first when they have a task at hand, not second, third, or heaven forbid, even fourth. Leadership is something that we are short on in this world, believe it or not. Looking out at y'all now, I'm really confident and I'm really inspired that in five, 10, and even 20 years, we will fill gaps in this world with strong leaders. Most of all, I'm looking forward to connecting with all of you guys on LinkedIn, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens when you start saying yes. Okay, so a few weeks ago at church, my preacher started going over this idea of camouflage. Um, and I was listening to him speak. I realized that this would be the perfect way to segue into my discussion for today. And I promise I'm not going to preach the gospel to y'all. It's not what I'm here to do. Um, I do hope this resonates with you like this should. Um, but through this series, we talked about the identities each of us were given. So we didn't get to pick if we were a man or if we were a woman. So throughout the series, I realized we need to live not through those identities, but we need to live through our goals. 
So each one of us were gifted with different qualities and attributes. Some of us may be good at math, but y'all have to use the calculator to check two times two. I was not gifted with the ability to deal with numbers, but that doesn't mean when I'm faced with the math equation in class that I shouldn't work hard to get the desired answer. So a little bit of background about myself. I'm from Kentucky, where I lived in a small town my whole life, and I could almost 100% guarantee that I've heard more stereotypes than just about anyone in this room. When I participated in the Leadership in the American Presidency program this past spring, the first thing one of, um, one of the students said to me was, do you all even wear shoes in Kentucky? And if you can see the look on my face right now, this is the exact look I gave that person. And um, I just, I realized I hear this all the time, so it didn't surprise me. So I just kind of smiled and with my Southern charm line, bless your heart, uh, went about my day. But my point here is that people outside of Kentucky portray people from small town Kentucky to be small minds, unintelligent minds who talk slow and who don't wear shoes. But that couldn't be farther from the case. In my small town, people even characterized me as not being able to succeed because I was just the dumb cheerleader. But to their surprise, I have began to succeed. I've had three successful internships, one of those being um, through the leadership of the American Presidency Program on the Hill with a representative of, a representative of Congress. Um, at 19, I was promoted to manager at my job back home. And now here I am on this stage talking to all of you driven, intelligent people. Do you all want to know my secret? I did not let who I am, where I come from, or my undeniable Southern accent define what I can do. Our gifts are not our identity. Who you are is not what you can do. As young women, we hear plenty of stereotypes and negative ideas of who we are and what we can be. We can be nurses and housewives. We can be secretaries and soccer moms. We can be cute and sweet, but never intelligent or assertive. But I know that we can be so much more. At some point in our life, we are all gonna work in a male-dominated workplace. And I think we looked this up, and just to give a little perspective, there are more CEOs named John than there are Mary in the workforce today. Um, but don't forget, as young women, we are the past. We are the present. Most importantly, let this set in your mind. We are the future. At some, take a look back. There are so many amazing women who have laid the cornerstone for our inevitable collective success. Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Oprah Winfrey, who rose out of poverty and became the first African-American woman billionaire. Amelia Earhart, who, when faced with criticism and negativity, became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. We can look at women from Frida Kahlo to Grace Kelly, and they have been criticized and put down because of their unapologetic attitude and their fierceness in the fight for women, and we see something extraordinary. All of these women came from different backgrounds. They were given different opportunities, and they were all blessed with different gifts but they all achieved one shared purpose, and that's success. I never thought as a 21-year-old that I would be standing on this stage talking to all of you about leadership, but here I am. Again, I did not let who I am dictate what I can do, and neither should you. So we all have a diversity of roles, but we all share unity and purpose. We are all working towards our individual goals, and that is great, keep working towards that, but also realize that we have a unity and purpose, and that is success. Because you are a woman does not mean you are any less. You can do amazing things, and I truly believe that you will go amazing places. Who you are today, tomorrow, or a week from now does not define your success later in life. What you choose to do with the camouflage you are given, the goals that drive you, and the purpose that inspires you is what determines who you are. So be a Sandra, an Oprah, an Amelia, a Frida, a Grace, or you can just be a Kelsey, but whoever that is, do not let that limit what you do. Well, being a recipient of positive recognition, like Kelsey talked about, is something most leaders strive for. Unfortunately, we don't always get to pick the way in which we stand out. And what we do with that standout attention that we get, but we don't ask for, is really important. Let me offer a couple of examples. There's a 14-year-old girl who bounced from trailer park to trailer park. Her mother consistently picked abusive, broke boyfriends who sometimes turned into husbands with money. And after being transferred from place to place, she now was being handed off to live with an aunt. And the life of each adult in the room was in such disarray that there was an exchange of drugs as a way to pay for the girl's living expenses. And as she sat there and she watched the situation unfold, she said to herself, this is not who I am. This is not what I am designed or created to be. The girl got married a year out of high school and soon after found herself pregnant with no money, three jobs, and no family on which to lean, she worked her way out of poverty while her husband worked for a college education. 
And that's where most people, where I come from, think the story should end. But that wasn't how she wanted to write her story, so she didn't settle. Today, that girl has her own college degree, is a successful nurse, and has exclusively been hired in leadership roles since she entered the professional workforce. That girl is my mother. My mother had a reputation, and because of this, people had expectations of her. And to this day, people in our town will walk up to her and they'll say, I always knew you were gonna make it. You had grit, you were a hard worker. But if they were being honest, what they would be saying is, I'm shocked you made it this far. But I am impressed. You exceeded my expectations of you. She is not what comes to mind when society thinks of privilege. I am. Now, if y'all haven't noticed by my accent or the size of my hair, I'm from Texas. And even people that aren't from Texas know that Texas is a little different. We like our water burger after 11 p.m., our tea sweet, and we love, and I mean love, football. And I know you're probably thinking, what does any of this have to do with your mom and expectations and I'm how low this whole thing is about leadership? But stay with me, I'll get there. My last name is Burleson. And if you walk onto the campus of Hardin Simmons University and you say that you know me, you'll be slapped with wide eyes and soft whispers. You see, my father is the head football coach of the winningest team in Texas. You heard that right, Hardin Simmons University home of the winningest football team in Texas. My peers and my professors associate him with intensity, competitiveness, and tangible success. And without ever saying it, and maybe not even realizing it, they associate the same with me. As an 18-year-old fresh out of high school, I was not prepared for how this reputation I didn't even know I had was going to impact me. And after the first boy that made eye contact with me on campus literally ran the other direction, I realized I had been reinvented. You see, you're supposed to get a fresh start when you go to college, but I didn't get that. You see, just like my mom, I didn't get to decide how others saw me, but my circumstances were different. I got into college, I basically have it paid for, I have an amazing family and support staff, I never have to worry where my next pack of ramen is gonna come from. I'm from a lower middle class white family. My parents are still married, my sister is still in school, y'all. I even got to get out of Texas to spend a life-changing semester in Washington, D.C. through the leadership in the American Presidency Program. Nothing bad has ever happened to me. But for the first time, I would recognized that I'm privileged and I have a positive reputation. And I felt forced to live up to the expectations that other people had set for me. But I couldn't live up to those expectations because they're not an accurate measurement of me. So this is what I've learned. While I must embrace my reputation, I must live my own expectations. So that's my advice, my next step, rule number three, embrace your reputation, but live your own expectations. Let's accept that we all have a reputation. And once we realize that's how people choose to perceive us, recognize that isn't who you have to be. Once we see how other people decide that we are, we can work to change that. We have resources, let's utilize them. Let's set our own goals. So this was my, awake. well, actually to add to that, let's set expectations that are reasonable based on our skill sets and our talents that we know we have. And I feel like if we do this, we will succeed. This was my awakening. I recognized my reputation and the expectations that come along with it, but I get to decide what I do with it. When you recognize yours, what are you going to do with it? We, especially as women, must embrace our reputation, but live our own expectations. Hi everyone, so a little bit about myself. First off, my name is Taylor. I'm a senior economics major and architecture minor at Clemson University. I like to think of economics as the engineering of the business world because it's a lot about using math to explain how the economy works. I absolutely love it. I think it's super cool and interesting. I learned the other day that your ring finger is actually an indicator of being better at math and science. In general, females tend to have longer ring fingers and males tend to have, excuse me, 
Males tend to have longer ring fingers, and females tend to have longer index fingers in comparison with the other. So if you hold your hand out like this, and your ring finger is longer than your index finger, females in particular, it actually means that there's more testosterone in your uterus, and this leads to a propensity to be better at math and science. Okay, so I thought this was so cool because my ring finger is longer than my index finger, and I'm pretty good at math, so this is pretty true for me. I've always loved math. I grew up in small town Maine, and though small, my public school system gave us every opportunity they were able to. Starting in the first grade, I was put into advanced math classes. I was seg segregated into this small group of students where often I was the only girl. My opinion was the only female opinion. My answer was the only female answer. And often it felt like I was like the female representative or something. I was the only girl in my math classes in elementary school and middle school. In high school, there were a few girls, but not many. Even now, as an economics major, I am outnumbered. There's between 30 to 50 students in each of my econ classes, and there's maybe five girls in each of them. Because I was outnumbered, I always felt an extra pressure to be right. I felt like I had to work extra hard to keep up and represent women well. I didn't want anyone thinking that I, or females in general, were any less capable in math. I didn't feel that I belonged. I felt even less like I belonged when I got an answer wrong. And it was this feeling of discomfort and standing out and not belonging that really wore on me. And it created an internal pressure to always be right. And the problem was that I started to doubt myself. And I started not speaking up because I thought that being silent was better than being wrong. Now, when I was in high school, I was chosen to be on a local game show called Messed Up, M-E-S-T. It stood for Math, Engineering, Science, and Technology. It was pretty nerdy. My teammate was also another student from my high school named Joey, and we faced a team of two boys. Now, while we were waiting in the break room to start the filming, I went to introduce myself to our competitors, and they blew me off. They completely ignored me and continued to do so for the rest of the filming of the show. Now, I couldn't believe that this had anything to do with the fact that I was female, but they had no problem speaking with my teammate, Joey. That is until we started to kick their butts. And we proceeded to kick their butts, despite having a girl on the team, all the way to semifinals. And it was then that I realized that it didn't matter what these boys thought of me. Their doubt didn't make me any less successful. I was the one getting in my own way, because I was doubting my own abilities. When I was able to get past the fear of failure, I was able to truly, finally be successful. Because failure is normal and it's part of life, and you will never you, but you can't live your life if you're constantly in fear. There will be times in your life when you look around the room and think that you don't belong. You should never doubt your abilities or the hard work that got you there. More importantly, you should never let that stop you from doing your best. So lastly, I'd like to share a quote with you from Jack Canfield, an American author and motivational speaker. This is one of my favorite quotes. He says, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Think about that. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. Through every new experience that I have tried, I have experienced some sort of fear. Whether it was moving by myself to Panama, Clemson, South Carolina, DC, or Italy, where I knew absolutely no one, I have overcome fear, and I have had the most amazing experiences. So it has taken me a while, and honestly, it's something that I still work on, to not let the fear of failure stop me from trying. Because failure is normal, and you will learn so much from every time that you fail. But you will never truly succeed unless you take the risk. Thank you. All right, everyone, hi, my name is McKenna. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about my rule. And just as important it is to not um, be afraid of failing, I feel like it's very important to not be afraid to deviate from your plans. So when I was in high school, basically all throughout my educational life, I loved math. Math was my thing. I even have the longer ring finger, so it's true. Um, it just makes sense in my head. It's easy for me, and I just, I love it. And I always wanted to go to school, major in math, and then get my teaching credential and be a math teacher because I love teaching others and I love helping others. And that was always my plan. I know it's very, like, womanly profession. There's nothing wrong with that. but. 
When I was in college, um, I started taking economics courses, which is still math too. And that started to click more in my head and I started to love that. So I switched my major to economics. And then uh, when I was in an economics class, a professor was talking about the program in Washington, D.C. through the Fund for American Studies and the Ronald Reagan Foundation. And that was never a part of my plan. I never thought I would work in government or in policy. I, um, I just never even imagined that. So I looked into the program and it sounded fun and it sounded like something different. And so I took a chance and I applied and I got in. And that's where I met all these wonderful women. Um, we had an awesome experience and it was scary, definitely scary for sure, because it was never how I thought my life would turn out. Um, and when we were there, we got there and I feel like none of us really knew what we were doing. We just kind of showed up and we were just ready to learn and ready to try something new. So that's another rule that I like to live by is it's okay to not know what you're doing all the time. You don't have to always be the smartest person in the room. You don't always have to have a plan and you don't have to know exactly what's going on. You have to be able to just show up and learn from others and you know just take it all in and take any opportunity. So with that, I just say like take any opportunity you have. It'll bring you so much more in life. Um, I never thought that I would want to intern for a government agency or end up working in government and maybe be um, a government representative one day. Um, there's just so many things you can do. So if you just keep your mind open and don't be afraid to change your plans, then you can you know, really succeed in life. That's it. <laughs> so I was that girl. I was the one with the hand-me-downs and the door of the Explorer haircut up until the third grade. I was the one who went to decent enough schools and the one who ate way too many breakfast tacos in the morning. And I was that girl that always had a bag of hot Cheetos on her. I was the girl with the gang members for friends, the one whose house was always tagged, the one whose mother and father had to fight through hell and continue to live through hell so that they could have a family of firsts. And I was the one who lost her parents to hate. I was the girl with the strict Hispanic parents, the girl that was taught to not speak Spanish, the girl who was supposed to be ashamed of who she was because her family felt the need to mask themselves, because she lost her family to the American dream. I was the girl who cried herself to sleep because of her parents arguing, because she understood the words bankrupt and debt and food stamps, at an age where she was only supposed to understand boys and school and a nurturing environment. I was the girl that was told college is not an option for you, Mexicans don't study science. The barrios aren't represented in government. Latinas don't go into space. Paired with this unhealthy American obsession of being cool, I was no exception. I was the girl who fried her curly hair and now it will forever be thin and damaged because curls weren't cool. I was the girl who attempted to pick a profession that was womanly, whatever the heck that means. And I was the girl that worked for the American Chemical Society. I am the girl that works for the United States Senate and I am the girl that works for NASA. Until 11 months ago, being that girl was the only life I'd ever known. I didn't jump, I didn't take a chance, I didn't set my mind to my grind, and I didn't change my mindset or anything like that. I recently had a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, I know, right? And about, it was all about how to get us, and us at the time was a room full of lawyers and economists and lawmakers, people that could afford the blazers they were wearing, people with 401ks. The question was, how do we get these people to care about the full intellectual capital of the United States. She, I told her my story and that she said I didn't just take a risk 11 months ago in moving to DC. 11 months ago, she said, you began to lead. She said there's no single answer to the investment of human intellectual capital, the full investment of human intellectual capital. But when you lead, people will follow. And with these five intelligent and beautiful women at my back that I didn't even know existed this time last year, I unknowingly led the biggest audience ever. And with $200 in my pocket and nothing to lose, I moved to Washington, D.C. You know, I had this huge, scary mentality of Washington coming into it before working on the Hill. And I think we kind of all do, that Washington is in such a bubble that it's untouchable by the nobodies like us, you know. Um, that like Washington eats up interns, especially interns like me that had such a small worldview coming in. Especially interns, you know, like people, exceptions, statistics, like me and my parents. We were just a minority. The kids like us were just a minority. And then I got there and I found out that I really wasn't a minority at all. The kids were the ones doing the change. 
I think, and I think that was my favorite thing that I learned from working on the Hill and then um, working in the professional workforce in general was that the people in charge were kind of like children and it was the children that were making the gears turn. You could do just about whatever the heck you wanted to if it looked like you know what you were doing. And maybe later on I might tell you guys how I accidentally stumbled into a few classified Senate hearings just because I had a rusty B face <laughs> um, and some headphones in. <laughs> you see, most people in working America like to have the road paved. If there's a set way of getting things done and it's proven that it works, you're not gonna look up to see how it can be working better. And you're certainly too proud to ask for help and to ask for recommendations. The cycle of poverty is a cycle for a reason. It's easy to lead that way, it's easy to put people into power who will lead that way, and it's even easier to teach that way. The most important question you can ask is why, the question that all children like to ask. But the loudest answer in our society has always been, well, because we've always done it this way. And that answer has always nipped creativity in the bud. That answer has, left to ter has led to turf wars and preventable deaths. That answer has been around since before women could even think of doing the things that we've done so far today. As women and as millennials, we're always scared to speak up. We're taught perfection as a child and not bravery, and the consequences of coming home without that A honor roll ribbon on your six weeks report card. But remember, the children are the most important because the children represent change. Because as Charles Darwin once said, it's not the strongest species nor the most intelligent that survives, but rather the one most responsive to change. So to the little girl who was told she can never go to college or pursue science, don't ever listen to people who tell you that you can do anything if you set your mind to it. To the little girl who doesn't know where her next meal is coming from or if her father will be home that day, don't listen to people who would tell you a simple mindset will make everything butterflies and rainbows. Because the truth is, you can't pick yourself up by the bootstraps if no one's gonna sell you boots because of your skin color, because of your gender identity, because of your sexuality or your religion. People won't sell you boots because of stereotypes or because you're entitled. Doesn't everyone your age get a pair of participation boots anyway? Don't ever listen to the people who would tell you it's that easy. Instead, listen to our rules. And rule number six, ask yourself what you would do if it weren't for your past. Ask yourself what you would do if it weren't any of those barriers you and others have convinced you would hinder the outcome for the rest of your life. Ask yourself what you would do if you weren't afraid and then do it. Take advantage of the built-in support that you have at school and at work, and you know who you can safely reach out to, because that girl never did it alone. Learn everything you can and make the world answer to you, because like a wise Supreme Court justice one told me, when you lead, they will follow. And trust me, you guys are ready. The only thing you have to do is put one foot out and then the other. And then you keep going after you get those diplomas you've earned. And you keep going after you've earned that dream job of yours that you didn't even know was your dream job. And then you keep going after that. You don't just walk, you lead until every stereotype is burned. Until every kid back home looks up to you. Until you change those worn out heels for some Louboutins and then you keep going. Until every child has an education. Until every person feels empowered and enabled by you and you alone. And then you keep going until the sound of your heels indicates the coming of a warm spring and a selfless leader. And you keep going until the dangling of your jewelry indicates the heart of gold of the owner, until the warmth of your smile wearing that deep red lipstick brings comfort to everyone around you. And then you keep going, and people will know with a leader like you, they can do anything. And then you keep going until every glass ceiling in your path is shattered, and you keep going. Until you find yourself clean across the country, standing on a stage, telling the same talk, to the very future of the United States. And then you keep going. Keeping in mind six simple rules and rule number six, when we lead, they will follow. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna stand here as this seat should be placed up here, but we're okay. Um, I like to stand anyway. Um, I am so humbled by what you women just shared because while, you know, as we were piecing together today's program, um, we had an internal conversation with our selection committee about placing on the main stage a panel of six wonderful women talking about their experiences that they've had and whether that would exclude half the people in the audience because they don't share the same gender. And I push back a little bit because what I recognize is that each of us on a daily basis deal with what they were talking about, identity. And whether you are female, whether you are male, whether you are 
uh, Latina or you are white, like these elements of our identity are placed upon us by society and they're also internal. We get those pressures from our parents. Um, I was constantly told that I was going to be the overachiever and so I naturally became the overachiever. And so I think it was really important to put their stories up on stage today because what I recognize is that they're just talking about identity, how we embrace ourselves, how we see ourselves, and where we see ourselves moving forward in the future. And so I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your personal stories today. They were beautiful and wonderful, and I was crying on the front row. <laughs> so uh, we have a few minutes. I'm going to keep my promise that we are going to be out of here at 11.45 for lunch. But we have a few minutes to open up the floor to questions to any of our panelists. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We've got one right over here. There should be a microphone coming to you. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry. I was going to say, okay, so this is a thing that I've been dealing with a lot lately, and I have, like, this new mantra, and rip off the Band-Aid, honestly. Like, that, once you take that first step, that is the scariest step that you will have. I came, from, I'm from Maine. My graduating class was barely 100 students. I've now, in the past year, lived in five different places, including three different countries. All you have to do is rip off the Band-Aid, and try something new, and you'll learn so much, whether it's that you love it or that you hate it, both, learning both of those things is equally as important. I think to build off of that, another thing is, when you rip off the Band-Aid, walk into whatever situation you're in as the most confident version of yourself, even if you're not feeling confident. Because when you exclude that kind of attitude of I'm not good enough, or I don't think I <laughs> should be with these people, other people, tend to, to cling to you when you're a confident person. So that's another way, I think, of stepping into something and saying, I'm, I don't think I'm supposed to be here, but I'm gonna do my best, and I'm gonna do whatever I can to get out of my comfort zone. Yeah, you also have to make sure that your risks are calculated. Um, and I think one of my number one pet peeves is when people are like, oh, it's okay to change your major all these times or whatever. Well, the truth is for people our age, changing our major is gonna cost thousands of dollars. You know, it's not that easy to just, you know, make mistakes for us, for people like us and millennials especially. So make sure your risks are calculated. Make sure you have a backup plan. Make sure you have a good support system in place. And then, you know, like they were saying, just once you're ready, once everything's in place for you to go and you have that plan B or C or whatever, just rip off that band-aid. It's also important to remember that fear is a motivator. And that's something that I really take to heart because even sitting on the front row before we got up here, like my heart was pounding and my hands were shaking. <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. But good things come out of fear because you act and you react. And so that gut feeling that you feel like you're gonna throw up and that anxiety is something that you can harness to go on and do something great. So I think that's really important. Great, do we have another question from the audience in the back there? I go to a continuation high school in Simi, and I'm often looked down because I go to this continuation high school and I'm not given a lot of opportunities, and I don't know where to start, so what can I do? Well, first of all, you're doing awesome because you're here. So you have taken a really important step and taken initiative because you're spending your Saturday at the Reagan Institute with all these other awesome people. So you just have to keep looking for those opportunities and actively seeking them out. Because there are so many young leaders in this room, people just assume that, okay, they're just going to find out whatever they want to, or someone's going to come along and help me. Well, even though we are millennials and we do like being helped and we don't like to ask for help, we think people will just give it to us, sometimes you have to have the confidence and the courage to do it on your own. I think all of us, especially with the way we got involved with the Reagan Institute and the LTAP program, is that we all kind of were looking for something. So as long as you keep looking and you keep making sure you're, you know, investing in these things that are going to make you better, whether or not that's like Googling 24-7, finding things that are going to get you out of Simi Valley and out of your comfort zone, um, just make sure that you're always actively pursuing to get out. Alice and I talked a lot about when we were in D.C., all of these amazing speakers would come and talk to us and they would say, once you do this, it'll be great. But Alice and I are really practical people, so if you don't give me like a list, like here's the steps you have to take, it doesn't make sense to me. And when Alice echoed that sentiment, it made me feel like a little bit more validated. So find a mentor and go to them and say, hey, this is what I wanna do, this is my end goal, and I don't know how to get there. 
So if you can tell me, hey, go to this class, hey, do this workshop, hey, work on your writing skills or your speech skills, that is just a step forward in doing things. Also, attending events like this is great too. If you don't have a mentor, you don't feel like you, anyone, you don't feel like you can go to anybody. I have business cards, my personal cell phone yeah. numbers on there. <laughs> Talk yeah. to Call us. Call me. Because I'm still in college. I mean, I'm, I'm only 20, y'all. Like, I'm not that much older. So I am willing to help you, and I have a little bit of experience. And if I don't have an answer, I'll find someone that does. One more question over there. Um, question over here. Raising his hand. Go ahead. Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey. Um, so all of, you, all of you ladies talked about how you're very self-made, very successful, uh, and that's awesome. And I want to hit on something that Rebecca talked about uh, with how this would, may seem that it may exclude men, but I don't think it does. What are some techniques or things that you think that men can do to empower women and enable them to become successful and strong and uh, you know, fully actualize their potential? That's an awesome question. Um, <laughs> I think that the first thing that you can do is recognize that this happens. I know for me, I didn't really realize that sexism and racism and all those things were still a thing until I got older and I started getting out in the world and people said no to me before they even knew what I was saying or on the fact that I know if I email someone, I will get a better response than if I call them because my email says Taylor, which it can be a guy and girl name, but my voice says female. So recognizing that that stuff happens and being aware of it and focusing on people's merit and not necessarily um, like their demographic is a really big thing and supporting all the women in your workplace. I think also um, picking back off what she said earlier about how, you know, not saying every guy does this, but you kind of brush off what a woman says and you don't listen to her opinion and you don't, you know, take what she's saying to heart. I think if you, not saying you don't do that, but if you start really listening to what women have to say, then you'll understand, you know, they kind of think the same way sometimes as me. Like, I, I believe that too. Like, I, I got the same answer from that question. You know, like, I just listen to what other people have to say in general. But if you want to help women, I guess listen to what women have to say. <laughs> With that though, like I said, my dad's a football coach and I've always been around the sport my whole life. And a lot of times if I'm the only female in the room contributing to this is how an offensive scheme should go or this is how a defensive scheme should go, people tend to say, oh yeah, 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 and really try to listen to me because I am a girl. So don't like patronize them. Like listen to them as you would a male counterpart, but don't be like, I need to listen to you because you're a girl, because that just makes us feel worse. It really does. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, so I know that there are a lot of people with hands in the audience, but I made you a promise, 11.45 lunchtime. But do not fret. We're not leaving just yet. Everyone sit down, two seconds. We've got a couple things to talk about before we leave. So first and foremost, I just want to thank you for sharing your stories and being here with us today. And can we give all of our wonderful women a round of applause?